God bless you. It is so good to be with you again at our weekly Bible study. And right now we are going to look into the chapter 22 of the first book of Samuel. Remember that the first, uh, or the chapter 21, we already dealt with. And what is it that we saw? in that chapter. So we saw that David finally ran away from the palace, ran away from being with the crazy king that wanted to kill him because of jealousy. And in chapter 20, he comes out. And so 21, we dealt with when uh, David came to Nob and he saw Elimelech the priest and Elimelech is surprised because David is alone. So David doesn't tell him the truth that he's running away from Saul, but that he is in a or on a secret mission. And that secret mission cost the life of 85 priests. And so we are going to see how this happened in chapter 22, uh, how the details played out of why these 85 priests died. It was not only because David didn't say the whole truth. It was because there was something pending with Eli's, fa Eli's family. It was pending with God, and God wanted to uh, deal with it, and God used this very regrettable situation. So, verse 1, chapter 22, First Samuel, the scripture says, David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Okay, so we see here that from being in the palace, from being protected for a time in the Rock of Ezel, he walks, he walks and he goes from there to Gath. And when he gets to Gath, he fakes being crazy a madman, he leaves there and he goes into a cave, to the famous cave of Adulam. His family found out that he was there and they went to go see him. But in the caves, in the cave of Adulam, in our cave of Adulam, because we're all going to go through a cave, through a dark place, but in that dark place, great things happen. There, in the darkness, in the depths of the waters, in the belly of a fish, Jonah repents of his disobedience to God, and he cries out for mercy. He is delivered to take the message that God wanted him to take to a city that was going to be destroyed. So as you can see, the dark places are for our benefit. There is profit in them. And there, when Jonah arrives to Nineveh, he gives a message of judgment. But God was in the midst of that. All of Nineveh proclaimed fasting and prayer, and they repented, and God forgave the city. In jail, Joseph was locked up. And there he was trained to become the famous governor of Egypt. The jail was the entrance to the throne. From jail, he went to reign. Daniel, when he entered into the lion's den, in that place of death, he was visited by an angel and the angel closed the mouths of the lions. And so God knows what we need. Be assured of that. We think that we need all types of blessings, uh, that we need to be blessed, that we will have no conflicts, that we will live in peace, that we will be prospered. And yes, we are blessed. And yes, we are prospered. But the Lord knows how to put us in places of prison. And though it seems something bad, it is where God will show us that He is with us and that only He can save us in this time. We seek for solutions to deliver ourselves from everything that we are going through, something so difficult, something that we hadn't seen and this generation hadn't experienced, just like this pestilence, this plague. Um, and like never before, we are seeing disobedience, anarchy um, to, to the highest of levels. 
And so we are seeing something that we had never seen before. And we look for resources. How do I save myself from this? But let me tell you that the darker that the picture of death and the danger of the enemy is around us and surrounds us, we are going to see the hand of God delivering us just as these men experimented the fiery furnaces they experimented all these things where nobody could save them however there was somebody who could save them and that somebody is our god and so in this time that we are locked away filled with problems with uh, menace of death upon us and all of this violence and all of these terrible things that are happening and we have reached a time of darkness where no one can deliver us. Only the Lord, our God, the Lord Jesus can save us. And so when David's family found out that he was there, they arrived. So it was not just his family that arrived, but it was many people. Many people who had problems, who were in debt, who were mourning a loss, who were bitter in their spirit. You know that there was bitter people? Do you know that nowadays we can see so much bitterness? All of that violence, all of those protests, is there's only one reason, a, a, a root in the heart. And so much discontentment and his bitterness. Problems that have not been resolved in the childhood, in the uh, teenage years, in the adult life. Lack of forgiveness for whatever happened, for the injustices, for the violations, for all of those things that maybe you have lived or are living now. Many are living that now and you are finding out, you are realizing. And so these are issues that are unresolved in the heart and they become bitterness. And so this is the type of men that came to the cave and and look at this beautiful time that we are going through in, in this time because there's hundreds or or maybe even um thousands or millions of people um they, these people showed up into the cave in that time of darkness but in that cave they found somebody they found a man who seeked god a man who heard them a man who was also living that pain, that abandonment, that uncertainty of tomorrow, but with a difference that this man named David trusted in God. And they came close to David and they took him as his leader, beloved in Christ. We, I believe that more than ever, we should take this, we should take advantage of this time to get close to our leader. Our leader is Jesus Christ. He is the only one who has the answer. When we get filled with the Lord, with his presence, though we are in darkness, though we are in problems, though we are in a cave, when we experiment the presence of God and that trust in God, then our, our leader is not going to fail us. And maybe there's many more people around you who need an answer, who need a solution, who are not happy, who are not satisfied to do evil, to, to get revenge from all of their hatred, from all of their pain. But they're going to look for people who have the answer. And David had the answer. Isn't that beautiful? To be able to go to our leader, Jesus Christ, and fill ourselves with him so that other people will also want to have his presence and have that answer and have that peace in the heart because there is no peace in the heart when we have that bitterness in our heart. There's nothing that satisfies and we look for justice, but there is no justice because when we look for justice, we harm because we don't know the true justice of God. And so a successful disciple you know, these men took David as their leader, and it's good to have a spiritual leader, a man of God, a woman of God that seeks for God, who knows where the answer is, and that we won't hear um, and, and, and try to look for answers in human science, but, a, but, the, but the advice from the Word of God. And David became a giant in that cave of Adulam. And you know, his disciples were very successful those men that showed up to that cave, they were extremely successful. 
because they followed the leadership of David. A successful disciple is one, will always be one who doesn't look for greatness. Number one, they follow their leader even in the little, but that little will be multiplied to them and will be a vessel, a vessel that God will honor and that God will want to use because it will be a vessel molded in the discipleship of brokenness, of humility, of repentance, of obedience. And so David became a giant in the cave of Adulam. Why? Because he looked for God and he trusted in God. And in that time, in that time of darkness, in that cave, that's where Psalm 57 is born. And look at what Psalm 57, being alone with God in that darkness, uh, without hope, but he had the trust in God. And it says, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed away. I will cry out to the God Most High, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. So look at where David looked for his protection and where he had his protection. Was it in that smelly, dark cave without oxygen? No. It was under the shadow of the wings of the God Most High, under that covering of the presence of God. And it's, uh, he says, that's where I'm going to be. He wasn't desperate to come out of the cave. He knew who was with him. And he says, until the brokenness passes. And so he remained there, there, until the calamities have passed, waiting on God, on his mercy, on his grace. And it says, he shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. He knows what resources, he knows how he's gonna send the help down from heaven. He was in anguish, very anguished. We saw the previous chapters, how he had to leave, running away, leaving his wife with a pain of a man who loved her because he loved his leader. He loved Saul. He, he loved, but it hurts a lot when you love somebody so much that they fail you to the point where they want to kill you. And so in this situation, in this brokenness, he writes this Psalm 57, inspired by the Holy Spirit, God comforting him, giving him the word of the Spirit for his life. And that same word is for you and for me during this time. Let's hold on to the words that come from the Spirit of God. And let's shelter ourselves under the shadow, under the wings of the Almighty. So we're going to see in um, 1 Samuel 22, 3 to 5. So we're going to see here the tendons of David to run back to Moab. He had gone to Gath. And he tells the king of Moab, he says, Please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. So he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the time that David was in the stronghold, in the strong place. But the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. So the tendency of David, this is where I want to begin. David had a, a carnal union in Moab. David always had that tendency, and it was that he was the great-grandson of Ruth, and Ruth was from Moab. So there was fleshly uh, bloodline connections. And so... When there's problems, sometimes we want to take refuge with the family, and it's a beautiful thing, but the family is never going to have the answer. Only God is. So this is a temporary relief. He went to Moab with his family, with his descendancy, and the roots of his great-grandmother Ruth. But in verse 5, Prophet Gad says, Hey, what are you doing here? Go to Judah. In the city of Judah, Judah means praise. So take time 
to go and praise God instead of looking for the resources and family support. And it's really nice when we're going through trouble and for the family to come and give you words of encouragement. But the words of encouragement that come from the human lips will never be the word of the Lord. The prophet tells David, verse 5, do not be here or stay in the stronghold. Do not, in other words, don't trust in the human strength. Go to Judah. Go to the city of praise. Take some time to go worship God. You are afflicted. You are emotionally sad. You are worried because of what is happening around us. Take time to pray. Take time to worship. Go to Judah. And so now we're going to see in verse 6, when Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered, now Saul was staying in Gibeah under a tamarisk tree in Ramah with his spear in his hand. And so look at here, brothers and sisters. Look at what Saul has in his hand. What does Saul have in his hand? It is a spear. And we can ask ourselves, I've asked myself, what's in my hand? What do you have in your hand? What do we have in our hand? Do we have the word of God? Or are we like Saul? Do we have a, a weapon of war? Willing to defend ourselves? Willing to seek justice with our own hand? With a weapon? Willing to bring solution to our own problems in our own way? What do we have in our hand? Saul had, he had a spear. He was paranoid. <laughs> He was defensive. When we have a weapon in our hand and not the word of God, we are going to believe that everybody's against us. And we're always going to be willing to jump and defend ourselves. And that we have the right to defend ourselves. Because, you know, we all have rights here. This country, everybody has rights over here. Even the devil has rights to have satanic churches in this country. And we all live under these rights. Instead of having in our hand the word of the Lord, the Lord promises us to deliver us from all of our fears and from all of our enemies. You believe that God is going to give rest to David? No. God had a plan for David. God was forming, forming a leadership, a powerful leadership, a leadership where the kings that were going to come after David would be able to be measured according to David's stature. Saul was out of control and to him it wasn't about, or to him it was about what he could offer, not about what God's will was. So listen to this. 1 Samuel 22, 7 through 8. Then Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give you every one of your fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? All of you have conspired against me, and there is no one who reveal, reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse, and there is not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. So look at how Saul was with a spear in his hand. And so he is accusing all of the tribe of Benjamin that they have abandoned him. Everybody was with him. The only one that left was David. But he's already untrusting, doesn't trust anybody. And Jonathan, yes, did have a friendship with David, but he feels betrayed by his own son here that made an alliance with David. And so, as you can see, he says, oh, but I offer you, I offer you vineyards. He is wanting to buy the favor of the people. And here, it's not about who offers more. It's about who will do the will of God. Verse 9, remember that in chapter 21, brothers and sisters, remember that when David went to Nob, there was a person named Doeg, the Edomite, and he was the over, he was set over the servants of Saul in verse 9 of chapter 23, uh, when Saul is saying, is there no one who is with me? 
everybody has turned their backs against me and since nobody answers um, so here Doeg speaks and he says and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath he said look he went to the priest and gave him provision and David even consulted with God and even gave him the the uh, spear or the sword of Goliath the giant so look at the information that this man gives to Saul because he was there and it says so the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest the son of Ahitub and all his father's house the priests who were in Nob and they all came to the king and Saul said hear now son of Ahitub he answered, Here I am, my Lord. So, look, the priest doesn't know anything. They heard the version of David. David said, I come from in the behalf of the king on a secret mission. And the priest that helped David, this is the story they heard. And so now this Edomite gives the information to um, Saul. And so... In verse 13, then Saul accuses them directly. Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword, and have inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it in this day? So Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David? He's saying, What are you talking about? If there is nobody, David hasn't done anything bad. There is no one so loyal like your son-in-law. He is so loyal to you. He's so faithful that he serves you and follows your orders and is honorable in your house. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Far it be from me, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to any in the house of my father. For your servant knew nothing of all this, little or much. So the priest is saying the truth. He didn't know anything of this matter. Of this is that this what is happening with David. David didn't say, Look, priest, I come running away from the evil of Saul. David didn't speak evil against his leader. And that's why he didn't know, not even a small or a big thing. And in 16, and the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Then the king said to the guards who stood about him, turn and kill the priest of the Lord because their hand also is with David and because they knew when he fled and did not tell it to me. So he was still hard-headed, sane and wanting to believe that they knew it, but they didn't know it. They didn't know that David was running away. So Saul goes and tells all of his army to kill them. So Saul sends, and the fury of Saul has reached its limits. He's not thinking anymore that these are the anointed men of God, that the anointed, anointed of God shouldn't be touched. David respected Saul so, so much that when he was about to kill him, he says, uh, let's not do it. Uh, let's not kill Saul. He always respected him because he had been anointed as a king and he respected him. And Saul is not respecting the anointing, the priestly anointing. And he sends for these priests to be killed. And so we see three, we see two kinds of people here because the soldiers of the army of Saul did not want to kill him. There are people, there's the kind of people who do, even though the orders are against the will of God. And the soldiers of David, of Saul did not want to do it. But there's this Edomite uh, by the name of Doeg, and he offered himself to kill them. And, but he forgot that there is a greater authority he could have said, well, this is the order of the king. This is, you know, the order of the governments. But Doeg forgot that there is an authority that is over and above all authorities. And that is the authority of God. And so they, you know, these soldiers didn't obey the authority of the humans. But Doeg did kill the priest. And it was 85 and they were the last ones. And there's a really sad point that we're going to deal with right now. And these priests, 
these 85 priests, with the exception of one who escaped, was, were the descendants of Eli. Who is Eli? Eli is the priest who was uh, taken, God took his priesthood, and he lost his life for a very grave sin. And it was the sin of not correcting his children. And his children, who were priests, dishonored the ministry. Eli, seeing the son of his sins, never corrected never corrected his sons he never he never got in the way of his son's sins they took of the offerings of the temple and they slept with uh, they had intimate relationships with the women inside the temple and when the ark was taken the ark of the covenant was taken by the philistines during a war and the people took the ark to the war because they were losing and they took the ark believing taking it as a a good luck charm because in the ark is where the presence of the Lord descended. But, beloved in Christ, we cannot take God as a good luck charm or say, oh, I'm going to open up the Bible in Psalm 91 because if I have it open, oh, God's going to protect me. No. Yes, the ark represented the presence of God, but without obedience to the word of God. There is no presence of God. Even though we might carry our Bible, even though they carried a box called the Ark, and the Philistines took the Ark from them, that box was only a symbol of the presence of God. But the presence of God is not with a man or the woman who lives in disobedience. They lost the war, they lost the ark, the Philistines took it. And when the news were given in chapter 3, when the news was given to Eli of what had happened, that his sons had died, that the ark had been captured, and that the Philistines had it. He was a heavy man, a heavy set man. And it says that he was sitting on a chair. He went back, he fell, and he hit himself in the head. And that is how he died. And this is tremendous. But this had already been forewarned to Eli. God will never, ever do anything before warning us, before giving us the opportunity to repent. God gave an opportunity to repentance to Eli. God spoke to him. And we're going to see it in chapter 2 of the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I don't want to extend myself a lot, but I believe that it's necessary that we will encompass this part and see that the reason why, even though Saul should have not sent to kill the priest, God could have used a different way could have used a different way for the priests of Eli's uh, household would die but there was a word that God had already spoken and we're going to see in chapter 2 in verse 29 and it says why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling and you have honored your sons more than me to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far it be from me. For those who honor me will I honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Notice, Eli did not honor Jehovah God. He allowed sin inside of his house. He allowed the sin inside the house of God. And God says, I'm going to honor those who honor me. You honored your children. You did not correct them. It says, look at the consequences. It says, and you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel. And there shall be not an old man in your house forever. So the descendants of Eli were not going to get to old age. It says, and so they were going to die in their young age, in their age of strength. And it shall be as a sign to you, in case you doubt, your two sons are going to die. 
and they died in the battle on that same day. And that same day, Eli, he died when he fell back from that chair. Verse 36, and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house, look at what it says, will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread. In other words, the one who was to be left of his household, if there was anyone left, he was going to die in misery, begging for bread. And this was fulfilled in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 27, because the only priest that was left was Ab Abiathar. And we're going to see it when we go back to the chapter that we are touching on today, chapter 22. So during that killing of those 85 priests, Abiathar escaped. But Abiathar, the whole time that he survived, when David was running, Abiathar was with him. But Abiathar went to go look for David because he was afraid. He knew that Saul was going to kill all the priests and he was a priest. And so David picks him up. He, 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 he receives him. And um, the scripture was that if any one of the house of Eli was going to be a, a, a begging bread and Abiathar was not faithful, he was not faithful to Solomon, David's son. When David was still alive, he still, during his, uh, while David was alive, he went to go look for the one who was conspiring against the David. So David commended into certain characters that we're going to see later. And it's important that we see this so that we will not act like these people. And so amongst these people is Abiathar. And so David said, Solomon, take care of him because he doesn't want the same thing to happen. So Solomon destitutes him from the priesthood and he sends him into exile. And so you see that the word of God is fulfilled. And sometimes we believe or we think that we can laugh at, oh, it didn't happen during this time. Oh, the Lord spoke, but uh, it's been 10 years, 20 years, and, and what God said hasn't happened. But God is always going to fulfill His word, His word of blessing and His word of judgment. So therefore, let's fear God, fear to offend Him, and let's live according to His will. And so let's go back, brothers and sisters, to chapter 22, which is what we are dealing with. And Doeg kills the priests in verse 18. It says, And the king said to Doeg, You turn and kill the priest. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck the priest and killed on that day 85 men who wore a linen ephod. So he struck with the edge of the sword both men and women, children and nursing infants. Verse 20. Now, one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the Lord's priest. So David said to Abiathar, I knew that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not fear. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. But with me, you shall be safe. And that is where chapter 22 ends. But David felt guilty of having twisted the truth and the consequences were fatal. Abiathar escaped and there was a broken relationship there with David. And so when he came together with him, that fracture, it healed. Abiathar looks for David and he realizes that David is not his enemy. He was able to recognize that it was not David, that his true enemy was Saul. And there is a lesson for you and I here. We have the same enemy. Though we're not in agreement as brothers and sisters and we don't agree with a neighbor, we don't agree with a family, there's frictions, there's brokenness, there's issues. And we might not be in agreement, but they are not our enemies. The true enemy is Satan. And we need to have that in mind. Abiathar realized that David was not his enemy. God is not our enemy when he tells us no on a lot of things. God is not our enemy when 
He lets us go through brokenness. Our true enemy is Satan. Brokenness is the hand of God, the hand of the potter working and molding our lives and working in us. And he's in that process. And you know that process? Many people reject because it's uncomfortable. And, and many people get bothered when we mention the word process. And it shouldn't make us feel uncomfortable because the processes of God is the hand of God in our lives, working in our hearts. But we reject that uh, process. And when we do that, we're rejecting the hand of God when He's forming us to the image of His Son. So in other words, what are we rejecting when we say, oh, uh, this process, I'm saved, I'm waiting for the throne, I'm called to do great things? Yes, David, there is no greater king than David. Um, nonetheless, look at the walk that David had to walk to become what God wanted him to become. Let's not reject the process of God. Let's not even get mad when we hear the word process because you're not going to escape. I cannot escape that process unless we unite ourselves to the enemy. Because in reality, God is not our enemy. And when he takes us through brokenness is because he is forming us, men and women, according to his heart so that we will have a leadership according to him, not a leadership according to Saul. And to reject the process is to take the leadership of Saul. To accept the process of God is to accept the leadership of the son of David, Jesus Christ. And that's beautiful. So in verse 23, he says, stay with me. I'll finish up now. Do not fear. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. But with me, you shall be safe. Beloved in Christ, with Christ, we are safe. It doesn't matter who looks for our life. There are words of hope, of encouragement. Do not be afraid. The Lord is always going to tell us, you're going to be safe with me. Don't be afraid. I am with you. I uphold you with the righteous hand of my justice. We're looking for justice, but the justice of God is perfect. And he sustains us in that perfect justice through Christ. And so to conclude, do not run to Gath. Do not run to the world. Do not run to Moab seeking for a safe refuge. There is no place in this world that is a safe place. Though they make secret hiding places, though they make a, an ark, supposedly they're making an ark right now as Noah made an ark in case the world floods. Oh, you know, people are going to get in there. They're sending rockets to outer space. Uh, so that when the earth, because they know that the earth has time, that the earth is on a time, on a stopwatch, it's running out of time. And it's in a process to be renewed and be back into the original state. But in order for the earth to reach its its purity, it's going to go through a purification. And so the scientists know this and they want to send people to the stars, to other planets that in case of danger and that this earth will disappear and like other planets have disappeared so that we will have a place to where the human race can continue. But this, these are human methods. The Lord says, though you might make your nest in the stars, from there I will bring you down. But where is our safe place? Read Psalm 57. It is beautiful. Our safe place under the shadow of the wings of the Most High. That is our safe place. Another advice for you, beloved, in this study. Let's not take carnal weapons. We don't need to defend ourselves with Goliath's sword. We don't need to use that. To use Goliath's sword is what we are seeing in the manifestations of violence right now. Using the wrong weapons. Our weapons are spiritual. They're mighty in God to bring down all of the evil in this world. And so we don't need the, the sword of Goliath or spears like Saul or to have that spear in our hands ready to defend myself. No, we need the word of God. Hallelujah. So that our spirit, so that our heart, our soul will enter in that peace. Thirdly, beloved in Christ, let's not divide ourselves. Jesus is not your enemy. There are so many groups, so many churches. There are so 
many faiths, we can say. And every each one says, my church is the best, oh, come with me. But all of that is division. For what? For what? The Lord Jesus is our leader. The word teaches us the truth. Beloved in Christ, your brother, your sister, if there's a conflict in the church, if there's frictions, they're not your enemies. How can we overcome the enemy? By uniting ourselves. That is the only solution. Not dividing ourselves. Not reproaching the one to the other because this, because that. No, that brings division. Arguments are the weapons of Saul. It is the weapons of Goliath to be bickering, fighting, and oh, who's going to confront me? And I'm going to go confront this, and, and let's see if they could handle me. And they did it to me, and they're going to pay me back. No, that is the spirit of Goliath with his weapons, the spirit of Saul, defensive. We need to unite ourselves with Jesus Christ. And united with Christ, there we will have a heart filled with peace, a heart a, a heart according to the heart of God, filled with genuine love. And so let's not seek to divide. The real enemy is not your brother. Your real enemy is Satan. And so we're going to stay on the Lord Jesus' side. David said, stay with me. So let's stay on the Lord Jesus' side. Let's put ourselves under the leadership of the son of David. Who is the son of David? Our captain, Jesus Christ, the captain of the Lord of hosts, God our Father. So, beloved in Christ, I hope that the advice of God will fill you with encouragement in these difficult times where so much violence, so much anarchy, so much death, of so much hatred. David was right to be bitter in his spirit, but he found refuge, a safe refuge, in the word that the Lord gave to him in Psalm 57. God bless you, beloved.
a broken and a contrite heart, you won't turn away. No, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, because of your stay.